Hey, good Thursday afternoon, everybody. I'm KHOU 11 meteorologist Tim Pandagis here with your tropical update. We're talking about Lee. That is now a category two hurricane and it is forecast to become a category five monster in just the next 36 hours. So rapid intensification is underway. I know you've been hearing that term a lot, and we're going to go through exactly what that means. Today is Thursday, September the 7th. 2023. All right, Category 5 storm is a big deal. They don't come around too often, and since 2016, we've had seven of them. Most recently was 2022, last year, with Hurricane Ian that made landfall in southwest Florida. Now, if you're a stat guy, you're saying, wait a second, I remember Hurricane Iota in 2020. That was a Cat 5, right? On post-analysis, after the season ended, they actually downgraded that back down to a Category 4, so it is not included in this list of Category 5 storms since 2016. Let's take a look at Hurricane Lee here. 105 mile per hour winds, that puts it at a higher end Category 2. It's a big jump from when we spoke yesterday when it was just a tropical storm with 70 mile per hour winds. It is intensified, and for all intents of purposes, it's done it rapidly and will continue to do so. This is a look at infrared satellite imagery. I love showing this because this gives us a great perspective of intensification as it's happening in real time. This is the temperature of the cloud tops. Colder the cloud tops, the more intense the thunderstorm activity is. The coldest cloud tops are indicated by the white shades here. And at times, closer to that center, that eye that's warming and clearing, is even colder cloud tops. That's what we call vortical hot towers. And when we see those on a loop of the infrared satellite imagery like we do here, that is a telltale sign that we have a rapidly intensifying tropical cyclone. Look at this convection just completely wrapping around that center, almost protecting that eye and walling it off from the outside environmental conditions. It's almost its own microcosm, if you will, of its environment here, just sustaining itself. And it's got everything in its path to keep it strong and getting stronger over the next couple of days. Thankfully, it's not in any direct line of sight of land right now, so we can admire what a natural spectacle this is at this time. Look at that eye just clearing on out over the last couple of loops there. On visible satellite, this is just textbook for what a hurricane looks like in the Atlantic Basin. We've got inflow at the, at the base, at the surface, and outflow aloft. You can see the cirrus, the outflows fanning out north and south. We've got inflow channels, moisture feed north and south as well. And it's very symmetrical. That tells us there's no wind shear being imparted on it, tilting it. It's standing up straight, got good posture, and it's ventilating properly. This engine is breathing well and it's going to continue to be that way as it heads off to the west-northwest. A closer look here, it's so vertically stacked that looking from the satellites and eventually as hurricane hunters get into this and fly through that eye, it's gonna be something called the stadium effect, where you've got such intense convection and thunderstorm activity around that center, walling off that eye, that down in the center of that eye, you can look straight down and see the ocean. You can see it there on the satellite imagery, uh, clearing on out there, and eventually we're gonna have some micro swirls in there too. Uh, microscale swirls, which just is a signal of a very intense tropical system. All right, here's the official track from the National Hurricane Center. Forecasting explicitly a Category 5 hurricane here by as early as Friday evening at 7 p.m. That's when we peak at 160 mile per hour winds, still maintained as a Cat 5 in early Saturday morning. And even though it slightly weakens, it is still a monster at this point in time by Tuesday morning when it's due north of Puerto Rico at a category 440 mile per hour winds. Now, what could lead to this weakening a little bit? When you get very intense tropical systems, they undergo something called eye wall replacement cycles. And that's when the eye gets, the storm gets so strong that the eye collapses in and of itself. And then it uh, moves through a period of some plateau of intensity or even weakening. And then a larger eye builds on in and then we undergo more intensification. So that could lead to a little bit of weakening here uh, during that time. It's still going to be a major hurricane, though. 140 mile per hour winds by Tuesday. We're looking at the Saffir Simpson scale here, how we rank hurricanes and tropical systems. It's uh, forecast to make it up to 160 mile per hour winds. I will tell you, that may be conservative, okay? Some of the hurricane models do bring it much, much higher. 
It's not unusual. We've seen that before, but 160 may be the bottom there that we may go a little bit higher than that. But that's a cap five starting at 157 uh, miles per hour. Here's where we are right now. So quite a jump in intensification over the next couple of days. Now, why is it going to get so strong? Well, we've got everything checked off on the recipe list to, or the ingredient list to build a major hurricane in the Atlantic Basin. We've been talking about this all season long, how warm the Atlantic waters are, the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, everything has uh, been about five to six degrees above normal. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot more extra fuel available for storms to use and intensify quickly. On the forecast track for Lee, we've got water temperatures at the skin of the ocean that are in the mid 80s. You need 79, 80, degree temperatures to really facilitate the latent heat transfer and the storms to really suck up that heat energy and use it to grow in strength. Well, we definitely have that. On top of that, it's not just the skin that's really warm. This part of the Atlantic Basin, that warm water extends down in some cases 70, 80, 90, 100 feet below the ocean surface. So what that means is when you get a very intense tropical system, the winds are whipping up the ocean, right? Something called upwelling. It's mixing the ocean waters. And when it does that, it tends to mix up cooler waters from a depth and deplete the warm waters at the surface. When you've got warm water down to uh, that depth, 100 feet in some cases, it's just mixing up more and more warm water. And this is an area that's just got that uh, uh, plenty of the warm water here. Now, in time, we're talking about the middle of nil to end of next week, way out past the five day forecast cone from the National Hurricane Center and the forecasted turn to the north from the computer models here. I want you to take note of what this is here. I'm showing this map that sea surface temperature anomalies, the either the, the, the cool or the warmer above normal. Okay, so this is the de departure from average is what I'm looking for, the word I'm looking for. The blue here is anomalous, anomalously cool from where it's been. Why? This is where Hurricane Franklin tracked just a week ago. And what that did is it, it, it extracted the heat energy from the oceans, mixed it up from the upwelling. And now we've got a patch of some cooler sea surface temperatures here. In a lot of cases, these are cooler than 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So if this does track over that, it could lead to a period of weakening as it's pretty much parallel to Norfolk, Virginia by the middle to end of next week. That's something to watch carefully. However, if it doesn't turn north and come through this cool pool, then it would stay stronger longer. In fact, notice the difference here and when it turns north from all these different computer models. It's going to depend on the timing here. We're certainly going to have to watch that. I want to go back to the forecast cone and point something out here that I think may stand out to some of you. But if not, I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here. Take a look at from Sunday at 7 a.m. Here we are. And we go back 24 hours to Saturday, 7 a.m. here. That is not a lot of real estate covered by Lee in 24 hours. This is about 220 miles from these two points. That would put its forward speed slowing to under 10 miles per hour. If it does slow down to that speed, that would throw off the whole steering potential of where it may go in the future. I'm going to show you what I mean here. So these are all our computer plots, the spaghetti plots, right? Each line is a different computer model. Very good consensus from where it is currently moving to the west northwest through about four or five days, the forecast cone of the National Hurricane Center. Once we get out to north of Puerto Rico, really north northwest of Puerto Rico, notice that we get a, a divergence here of the forecast plots. They start to spread out a little bit more and they all do take a turn to the north. But when exactly that happens has to do on that forward speed. OK, and it's going to have to do with what's going on in the steering, all the players on the field. So what's going to be out there at that point in time as we get into early next week is a subtropical ridge to the north. That's what's been steering Lee off to the west for now. It can't lift north because it's got a bubble of high pressure that's preventing that movement to the north. But as we go into the middle of next week, that ridge is forecast to weaken a little bit. If that happens, there's going to be an exit path for this to start lifting to the north. However, if it slows down, like I just mentioned, 
it may miss this window of opportunity to lift to the north or it may take it later or sooner. It's all going to depend on how much this breaks down and when it does in fact take that turn to the north. Now if it takes it a little bit later, it tracks a little bit farther to the west, it'll eventually run into a dip in the jet stream, a trough developing over the southeastern portions of the United States that should keep it well offshore of the eastern seaboard. However, recent model trends do show this not being as strong and not as progressive, meaning it might not make it all the way to the southeast coast, preventing impacts on the eastern seaboard. I'm not saying it'll happen. It's saying something that we need to watch carefully as we go out in time. And when that turn north happens, will determine what impacts, if any, are seen on the eastern seaboard. Let's talk about global models now. Here's the GFS, the American model, playing it out through next weekend, okay? So there's a lot of time to watch this. It's gonna be with us for quite some time. By next weekend, this thing is all the way up to the north, impacting Atlantic Canada still as a major system here with a massive wind field. As storms gain latitude, they also spread out their wind field. Here's a look at the European model. Notice the differences, GFS is farther east. European is farther to, the, farther to the west, and that would mean possibility of impacts to New England. And then eventually Nova Scotia and Atlantic Canada as well. Now, even though the Lesser Antilles will miss this one, direct impacts at least, there still is the possibility of the Northern Leeward Islands seeing some impacts from some gusty winds. The possibility of tropical storm force winds, the probability of those is low, but it's there, 20 to 30% chance as the biggest chunk of Lee is well to the north. Now, even if Lee stays well off the eastern seaboard, which is what we want, we don't want impacts to the east coast, there still will be indirect impacts in terms of wave heights, coastal erosion, and rip current risk for quite a while. Here we are by next Friday. This is forecast wave heights. And look at some of these waves. You see these yellows and oranges? That's 25 to 30 foot waves offshore. Some of those propagating all the way to the west and impacting the eastern seaboard. So keep that in mind. Wave heights, swimming conditions will not be good as that races on off towards the north. All right, let's talk about rapid intensification now. You're going to hear it all over the place as this continues to intensify. And what the actual definition is from the National Hurricane Center is an increase in a storm's max sustained winds of 30 knots, like 34, 35 miles per hour in a period of time of 24 hours, one day. So what we've already seen with Lee, if we go back to 11 a.m. yesterday up to today's 11 a.m. advisory, we've already seen the uh, definition get satisfied for rapid intensification. Went from 70 miles per hour to 105 miles per hour, an increase of 35 miles per hour and max sustained winds in 24 hours. We're not done intensifying though. Look at the upward trajectory here to Friday afternoon. 160 mile per hour winds cap five right in an early Saturday morning. That is an intense system. We've got Lee out there. That's gonna capture our headlines for the next couple of days, but it's not to be uh, left out as Tropical Depression 14. That just developed. That's a pretty robust wave coming off the coast of Africa. And here's how it looks on satellite imagery. Looks pretty good. It's got outflow coming in off the Cabo Verde Islands, but where's this going? Thankfully, it's gonna stay way out at sea and recurve, but it will still likely get the name of Margo as it intensifies into the season's fifth hurricane. But notice that recurve to the north takes place well before it gets anywhere close to Bermuda. So that's some good news there, maxing out at 90 mile per hour cat one by next week. All right, that's the latest. I know we went over a lot here. If you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out. I love talking weather any time of day. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or even on TikTok as well. I'll see you again tomorrow for an update on Lee and what may be Margo at that point as well.